You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Hello everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War, episode 43. This week, I would like to thank Christina, Jennifer, and Harry for their donations to the show. Harry and Jennifer are from Australia, and Christina is from Belgium. The international nature of the listeners to the show sort of boggles my mind if I think about it too much. If you would like to contribute to the show, you can at historyofthegreatwar.com slash donate. I would also like to thank listener Harrison for a bit of grammar correction, and don't worry Harrison, I won't be making those mistakes again. This week is our fourth episode in a row detailing the events on the Eastern Front during the summer of 1915, and it will also be our last episode in the theater for a while. We will be traveling to other theaters for most of the rest of the year, but I think it will be pretty obvious why this is the case once we get to the end of this episode. Last week, we saw the Germans make a giant gash in the Russian line that caused them to have to retreat. The retreat would go on mile after mile as the Russians stayed one step ahead of the Germans. First, we will discuss a bit about the retreat and how it was going, before we take a break from the action to look at a change in the Russian high command. We will then look at the last attacks in the north and the south during the fall of 1915, before all of Germany's strength and hence all of the attacking forces in the East, were moved on to other theaters. At the end of the episode, we will of course take a step back to look at how all of the attacks had affected all of their participants and the damage that had been caused during the battles. It was a lot of damage. We start today by picking up right where we left off last week. The Russians were retreating from the German attack. After bungling so many operations up to this point, you might expect the Russian retreat to be a rout that was disorganized, and in general, a disaster. But this wasn't actually the case. Unlike almost every action up to this point, the Russian retreat was organized, especially when you take into account the situation that they were in. The Germans in the north found themselves slowed by some of the rivers that they were having to cross, which gave the Russians time to give ground before them. There were also several fortress complexes in the path of the Germans that they had to deal with during their advance. One of these was Novo Georgiesk, which I will be referring to as Novo from here on out, because that is really hard to say. This is one of the fortress systems that we talked about last week that the Russians were pretty dead set on holding on to. Novo especially was a symbol of Russian power in the region and therefore the Russian high command gave a pretty decent amount of thought to its defense. Alexeyev, however, didn't want to spend many resources, if any at all, to defend it. He thought that it would turn into another Kovno, where a large number of troops and shells had been quickly captured by the Germans. Alexeyev fully believed that the fortresses were just a trap, and the more resources you put into them, the more they were going to get trapped when they fell. High command disagreed, and they believed that Novo would be more like Shemeshal, that had held off all attempts to take it for months. To reinforce the defenders of the fortress, Alexeyev sent just three divisions. The 11th Siberian, which was basically just a skeleton division at this point, after taking part in so much fighting, and two second-line divisions, the 63rd and the 58th. The 58th didn't even arrive at the complex until the very last moment before the Germans' attack began. These men joined the permanent defenders of the complex along with their complement of guns and shells, of which they had nearly a million. There is a possibility that some of the resources dedicated to the defense could have been evacuated if it had been ordered before Warsaw fell, but Russian officials blame a lack of rolling stock as the reason that this couldn't happen. They were basically using a lack of trains to justify doubling down on the defense, especially after the events of the siege occurred and it wouldn't end up going so well. They were, they were basically just trying to justify their decisions. 
After the Germans had captured Warsaw, they moved on to Novo and began their siege. There is a story that seems to pop up in several histories, that on the very first day of the siege, a Russian chief engineer, while making rounds to the forts, was captured along with a map of the entire complex. General Wessler, the German who had helped to, to capture Antwerp, was moved in and supervised the siege, and with the plans that were captured, it was really quite easy. When the dust had settled, the Germans had captured 90,000 soldiers. As we have discussed on the show several times, the Russians were not very quick to order a retreat. But now that it was a fact, the entire chain of command really bought into the idea and made it happen. Some historians actually question if they had to retreat as far as they did. It may have been possible to stand and fight the Germans well before the Pripyat marshes, but once the Russians started believing that they didn't have the men and materiel to stand and fight, it was hard to break out of that mindset. Retreat was always the safer option for them at this point. By August the 7th, the Polish salient was mostly flattened, and by August the 22nd, a line ran from the fortress of Osowiec in the south, a fortress that was still holding off the German advances, up to Brest-Litovsk, and then north. Very soon after arriving, the Russians abandoned Brest-Litovsk and started to retreat into White Russia. In theory, Brest-Litovsk had been a fortress as formidable as any of the others that the Russians had, but it was just abandoned at the last moment instead of standing and fighting. The fortress of Osoviec actually stood for quite a while, as long as any of the fortresses that the Russians tried to defend, but it was also taken on August the 26th. In an ideal world, the German armies in the north and the south would have been able to pinch off some Russian forces surround them, and force them to surrender. Mackensen and Galwitz both had strong forces, and they were both doing their very best to advance as quickly as possible, but the goal of cutting some Russians off just wasn't possible. In his book The First World War, John Keegan would write, quote, Every day the Russians would retreat, three miles or so, construct a new line and wait for the Germans to stumble up towards it. In time, the Germans came up to primeval forest and the great marshes of the Pripyat. End quote. The German commanders were actually quite impressed with the conduct of the Russian retreat. In their journals and official documents, when speaking of the retreat, they would praise the Russian organization. As the retreat continued, the Russians kept getting stronger and stronger as their line shortened and they were joined by reinforcements. This strengthening of the Russian line, just as the Germans were getting further and further away from their supplies, was just too much for the Germans to break through decisively. The Germans were even having troubles properly utilizing the force that they did have. At times, Galwitz was only able to utilize half of the men under his command because there simply wasn't enough of a front to try to attack. But by far the biggest problem for the Germans was the difficulty of getting supplies to the front. The rail lines that they were using to supply the forward troops all stopped at the Vistula, and every step beyond that point was one more step away from the rail dumps. But it wasn't just the railways that were the problem. The roads in most of the country that they were moving through weren't what one would call great. Everything that the tens of thousands of men had to need to march and fight had to be pulled forward over these roads, and every day it had to be pulled further. Even simple necessities like water became a huge problem for the Germans. The Russians had been dealing with these same supply problems in the area, but they had the advantage of having a static line to transport supplies to, and they didn't have to try and keep up with an advancing army. The Germans also had the disadvantage of advancing into territory that was completely decimated. Much like the Germans did in their retreat to the Hindenburg Line in 1917, the Russians were making sure that the Germans found nothing to help them along. The scourged earth policies of the Russians meant that any type of food or supplies that couldn't be carried with the Russians was destroyed. Cattle and pigs were either driven east or killed on the spot. This decimation would leave a scar on the countryside that would still be affecting the area long past the end of the war. There were also a huge number of refugees that the Russian activities created. Millions of non-Russian ethnicities of eastern Poland found themselves kicked out of their homes, which were often destroyed, and forced into the countryside. They would suffer horribly from diseases like cholera, typhus, typhoid, or just simple starvation. 
thousands and thousands of them would die, but the extent of the suffering and the exact number of deaths will probably never be known. The Russians had now successfully extricated their men from Poland. But after the great defeats of July and August, it was time for our second big command change during the war, the first being the replacement of Moltke by Falkenhayn. Near the end of August, the Tsar sent word to Grand Duke Nicholas that he was being transferred to be the Viceroy of the Caucasus. It was technically a promotion, but everybody knew what it really was, both at the front and back home in Russia. The Grand Duke was popular in most of Russia, and so his forced removal from the command position was taken hard on the home front, with some students rioting at the Grand Duke's alma mater upon hearing the news. The replacement would be the Tsar himself, which was odd on a few levels. First, he had no real military career to speak of, and second, he was also known as a bit wishy-washy when it came to making decisions. Heck, half of the problem during his reign was because he wasn't decisive enough when he needed to be, and now he was in overall command of the Russian armies. Nicholas claimed that part of the reason that he made himself commander was out of, quote, duty to the country which God had committed to my keeping, end quote. He also thought that he needed to share in the burdens that his country was facing during the current struggle. This would be the only instance during the war where a monarch of one of the European countries would take direct command of their troops, and for good reason. Monarchs in 1914 weren't military men in the vein of Frederick the Great or Henry V. There were professionals for that. Nicholas was under no illusions, though, about what the change might mean for him. He would be quoted as saying to the French ambassador that, quote, Perhaps a scapegoat is what is needed to save Russia. I mean to be the victim. May the will of God be done. End quote. I mean, I admire the guy for his sacrifice that he knew he was making at the time, but if I was one of the military leaders of Russia, I probably wouldn't have been filled with confidence by the move. The Tsar also cleaned house in the Russian high command, and would appoint Alexiev as his new chief of staff, which from everything I have read, and I don't call myself an expert on the talent pool that was available, seems like a pretty good choice. The change of command would be effective on September 1st, just in time for the Tsar to be in charge when the final lunges by the Germans and Austrians took place in September. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. By the end of August, the Russian center had fully retreated, and the German advance had been halted. There were, however, two last attacks to be launched, and the first would be in the north, where Ludendorff would again attack out of Courland. In late August, Falkenhayn had informed all of this, the commanders in the east that all offensive operations needed to be spooled down in the near future. Reports were mounting of renewed Allied offensives in the west, scheduled for September, so it was important to get reinforcements onto the western front before those attacks hit. Even knowing this information, Ludendorff, and also Conrad to the south, would launch their attacks. The objective of this new attack was to capture the city of Vilna, which is now called Vilnius and is a city in Lithuania. <laughs> 
Ludendorff hoped that with his attacks on Vilna, he could get one last large attack in before more of his resources were taken from him and sent west. Throughout the summer months, Ludendorff had a lot of success in the north, but now the situation was different. No longer would the primary focus of the Russian commanders be on trying to stabilize the center of their line. Now they could focus on Ludendorff's attacks specifically. Also, with their line shortened considerably, there were far more reinforcements available to the Russians than at any point in the summer months. Both of these factors would make the capture of Vilna all the more difficult for Ludendorff and his men. During the attack, Ludendorff would command 32 divisions that were concentrated for the attack against just 18 divisions of the Russian 10th Army. On September 9th, the attack began, with the German attack right at the city, but they quickly ran into difficulties. The Russians had prepared themselves for a frontal attack and were concentrated perfectly to meet the German thrust towards the city. Because of this readiness, the first German attacks hit the center of the Russian line and sort of just bounced off. In response, Ludendorff moved his primary point of focus to the flanks, and he found a weakness on the Russian northern flank. The Russians had sacrificed the strength of this area to reinforce their center, and when the Germans attacked on September 12th, they were able to penetrate far enough to cut the main Vilna to Riga rail line, which was extremely important, since it was the best way to get supplies in and out of the city. The cutting of the rail line alarmed the Russians, and prompted them to move four more corps, an entire army, into the area. This meant that the Germans were now outnumbered by the Russian defenders. It is often difficult to successfully attack with less numbers than the defenders are able to field, and the Germans experienced these problems as well. When their attacks continued, they were obviously having some severe difficulties. The new Russian army had been positioned to keep the Germans from advancing further east, but the Germans found that they could still attack to their south, which might just let them cut off Vilna. It was this German advance south, and the possibility of being cut off in the city, that caused the Russians to abandon the city on the 17th, and by September 18th, the Russians had captured Vilna. Further attacks were launched in the coming days after the fall of the city, but the number advantage was just too high for the Russians, and the German attacks were quickly beat back, and they were even put on the defensive for a bit. In late September, Falkenhayn requested more troops for France, in the form of 13 divisions, and Ludendorff was forced to abandon the attack on September 26th. The battle is one of the battles that, depending on the historian's thoughts on Ludendorff, you get some pretty wildly differing opinions on it. If the historian isn't a big fan of Ludendorff, you get a lot of talk about how there were far too many casualties for what was gained, and that Falkenhayn was obviously correct in making sure that Ludendorff was restrained throughout the summer. On the other hand, if the historian is a fan of Ludendorff, they often point to the fact that if Ludendorff had been allowed to launch similar attacks earlier in the summer, the Russians would have been far more vulnerable. They point to Falkenhayn's cautiousness as what kept Ludendorff from making a decisive move. Both of these views may be correct, or at least partly correct. The attacks in the north would have been far easier if they had been launched earlier when the Russians were preoccupied. At the very least, if the Germans wanted to attack in the north, it should have been done earlier. But I personally don't think they should have. Even if the attack would have been very successful, it probably wouldn't have had a big effect on the situation. By the time you hit Vilna, unless you are going to commit fully to capturing Riga, which is quite the stretch of distance, you are in sort of a dead zone in terms of important objectives. Just jump on Google Maps, uh, do a search for Vilnius, and check it out for yourself. Just keep zooming out until you see something that looks important. It's quite a ways away. Not to be outdone, but always playing second fiddle. In the south, Conrad wanted to launch his own attack to keep up with Ludendorff's in the north. I know that I often fall into pretty flippant language anytime I talk about Austrian attacks in recent episodes, and I finally realized why that is like right now, while writing this sentence. In my mind, I see Austria as Germany's younger brother. He sees his older brother doing really cool, awesome things, and he just has to give it a shot. He never quite manages to make those attempts pay off. And as an outsider, you can't decide whether to laugh or to give him props for trying. This is how I see Austria-Hungary in 1915, 
a younger brother who just wants to be cool. I also thought it would be fitting to end our discussions of the Russian defeats at the hands of the Germans by discussing a Russian victory over the Austrians. G.J. Meyer would have this to say about the Austrian attacks in his book A World Undone. Quote, On August 31st, apparently swept up on one of his periodic fantasies about duplicating the triumphs of the Germans, Conrad had launched his tattered forces on a sweeping offensive, aimed at encircling 25 Russian divisions, and after defeating them, driving eastwards into Ukraine. End quote. Conrad's goals were lofty, encircling 25 of Ivanov's divisions in Galicia. And when the first attacks were launched, there was actually a bit of success. Through the last few days of August, the Austrian troops were advancing in eastern Galicia. Ivanov was forced to ask his commanders to send him reinforcements, but none were given. Conrad believed that this would be his time of triumph, never mind the fact that it was at this moment that six divisions were being pulled out of the line and being sent to prepare for the Serbian offensive. It was also not coincidentally around this time that those divisions left and things went completely off the rails. The Austrian Fourth Army moved forward out of the city of Lutsk and did not properly guard its flanks. Russian troops attacked out of a forest and took 70,000 prisoners in one day, September the 22nd. With this massive loss, the Russians were forced to retreat, giving up most of their advances. With the retreat continuing, the Austrians were forced, once again, to ask for German help, and troops were sent south to recapture the city of Lutsk, which the German troops did, successfully, the last week of September. While this attack only occupies the second-to-last paragraph of this episode, it was still extremely costly for the Austrians. Around 300,000 casualties were suffered, in basically what ended up being a throwaway. A huge number of these were troops surrendering, or being marked as missing in official reports. The 4th Army alone marked 30,000 as missing, while having 10,000 wounded, 7,000 sick, and 2,000 killed. Austria's first attempt at an independent attack in months had been a complete and utter disaster. With the winding down of the two battles in the north and the south, the months-long battle in the east was finally over. The list of casualties was massive, with the Russians losing 1.4 million men, 750,000 of which were captured. Let me just repeat those numbers. 1.4 million with 750,000 captured. It hadn't been a bloodless summer for the Germans, though. They had lost around 300,000 men, and the Austrians had lost around 300,000 as well. So when you add all of that up, 2 million men killed, injured, or captured during the five months of fighting in the Eastern Front of 1915. It is probably worth comparing this to another battle. Maybe it will help put it in perspective. So, Gallipoli only about 500,000 total casualties on both sides during the months of fighting. On the Somme in 1916, uh, around a million. Verdun, around a million as well. Still only about half. Stalingrad, the battle of World War II. The one where the Germans staked everything on capturing the city, and the Red Army staked everything on holding it. Two million casualties. Finally, we find something similar. During the retreat, the Russians had destroyed huge swaths of the countryside, causing millions of people to become refugees. Most of these new refugees were non-Russian ethnic groups, like Jews, Poles, Lithuanians, Latvians. The Russians also had lost a huge amount of territory, and had been forced to retreat all of their lands in Poland all the way to the area around the Pripyat marshes. Now even though the Germans had inflicted so much damage on the Russians, they were unable to achieve their goals. Their goal had been to cripple Russia so badly that it would either look for peace or would be incapable of continued resistance. Unfortunately, by the time the fall rains came and they had given up the attack, neither of these things had come to pass. The Russian army had lost many commanders, of course, both in the form of casualties or dismissals, and their supply situation was still pretty bad, and for the next several months of the year, the Germans would have command of the Eastern Front. But the Russians weren't out. They were still standing after the Germans had thrown so much at trying to beat them down. They still had men to train up and prepare and equip, 
and in just nine months, they will be back. And in 1916, they will launch another round of offensives against Austria-Hungary, and they will be successful. While the Germans hadn't achieved their ultimate goal, the breather did allow them to check a few things off of their to-do list. First on that list would be the conquest of Serbia, that we will cover later this year, and second was a move of troops to the west to meet the incoming French and British attacks. Even with all of the success, though, on the German side, the tension between Falkenhayn, Ludendorff, and Hindenburg wasn't even close to over. This is from uh, G.J. Meyer again, from A World Undone, quote, As for Ludendorff and Falkenhayn, all the successes of 1915 had done nothing to cool their mutual hatred. When they met at Kovno late in the year to join in the Kaiser's ceremonial celebration of their conquests, Falkenhayn used the occasion to throw down the gauntlet. Quote, now are you convinced, he demanded of Ludendorff, that my operation was correct? Quote, on the contrary, Ludendorff replied. Russia had not surrendered. Russia had not sued for peace. How could anyone be satisfied? Falkenhayn was heard to say that when the war ended, it was going to be necessary to court-martial Ludendorff. With the close of the summer offensive, we will leave the Eastern Front for probably the rest of the year. It has been a long, hard road for both armies, and there wouldn't be much action in the theater until 1916. I will also be taking a short break from the show for three weeks, during which I can prepare and get a good head start on the episodes for the rest of the year. Just to give you a basic outline on what you have to look forward to when I come back, I will spend a few episodes on the action on the Italian front, uh, followed by several more on the war upon the seas, before launching into a many-part saga of the 1915 Western Front fall offensives. I'm not sure how many episodes that said will be, uh, at least five, probably, maybe more. I'm, I've learned that I'm really bad at estimating. So anyway, I wish everyone who listens a very wonderful month of July, and I hope you will join me in three weeks for History of the Great War 1915, Part 2.